<laughs> she is going out of her comfort zone. Okay. I'll just put the corset there. Um, actually, I can probably have the... You hold on to the pockets. Yeah, you hold on to those. Garters, corset, split drawers, and chemise. Okay. If you don't like the hat, you can take it off. It's okay. <laughs> Only for you, my dear. I know. I'm um, good evening. We're going to go ahead and get started so that Kathy and Joe can share their presentation with you. First of all, welcome to Waite High School. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so thank you for returning yet again to this TPS lecture series. We appreciate it. When you leave this evening, if you could please pick up a... It's for the live stream. Uh, if you want to pick up a blue postcard, it has the next lecture on it, which is going to be held at Bowser High School on March 9th from 7 to 9 p.m. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, um, but feel free to take one of these with you. Uh, I know several of you had difficulty getting into weight, so let me just share this story with you. I want to dispel the urban legend that the architect of Waite High School, High School built it backwards and committed suicide. Okay, so for future reference, we will be having tours of this building next fall. I believe it's set for October. The front entrance is actually over here next to the flagpole, and there's a parking lot just off to the side. So next time we gather and we say the front entrance will be open, feel free to park in that side lot and come in the back, uh, front. The back side, several people think that this was built backwards. It was always uh, built to face East Toledo and not the river. So I'm dispelling that urban <laughs> legend tonight. He can rest in uh, peace now. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I'm thrilled that you're here tonight because you're in it for a very special treat. I wouldn't dress like this for just anybody in the world, but Kathy Dowd is my dear neighbor, literally my next door neighbor, and Kathy is just a wealth of information on, on historical costumes, and her son Joe is with us tonight. Joe is a national park ranger. He makes his own military uniforms and clothes, and they're going to talk about it. These are two wonderful individuals who are trying to preserve what it was like to live uh, life back then, and so we're just thankful they're here tonight. So this is Kathy and Joe Dowd. Welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, good. Um, as Robin said, my name is Kathy Dowd. I have a master's in, in, in historic apparel design from Bowling Green State University. There are only two of them existing in the world, so I was very fortunate to uh, be able to study that because it's not something where you just go and say, I want to st study historic clothing design. I could have gone through the theater department, but I didn't want to do the fast and dirty way. Um, I ended up being a professional theatrical costume designer anyway, so I did learn it through that way. But um, I purposely went through clothing and textiles so I could learn the historic aspect of it because Joe and I both believe if we're going to teach history, we need to teach it accurately. So with that said, um, I'm going to have Joe introduce himself. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Joseph Dowd. I'm an interpretive ranger with the National Park Service, formerly serving at River Raisin National Battlefield Park up here in Monroe. Uh, in a few weeks, I'll actually be transferring to Horseshoe Bend National Military Park in Daveston, Alabama. So I'm very uh, happy to be able to give at least one more historic lecture here in my hometown of Toledo. So we're going to get started here tonight. Um, as already said, thank you for coming out on this very windy February evening to learn what early settlers and soldiers of the Old Northwest War and how they lived. In the 1800s, the Maumee Valley looked quite different than it does today. While dense forests of elm and buckeye planted most of the Ohio country, a choking maze of tangled swamps and oak barrens in the Maumee River Valley presented problems to the early homesteaders. Of course, long before the homesteaders and the soldiers arrived, Native Americans, the original inhabitants of the Ohio country, called this place their home. Following the American Revolution, many settlers left the East Coast to pursue a better life in the territories north of the Ohio River. What we now refer to as the Old Northwest. Many of these early pioneers were Revolutionary War veterans who were given land bounties for their service in the War of Independence. However, war would soon come back to Ohio as Native people would fight to preserve their homes and traditional life ways and as Great Britain would attempt to stifle the United States influence in the area. The Northwest Indian Wars, the War of 1812, and the Indian removals of the 1830s were all acts in a multi-century contest for control of what we now call the state of Ohio. Now tonight we're going to look at the clothing and life ways of the people who made history here. The farmers who first tilled the soil of the Maumee Valley, the mother who battled starvation, deprivation, and war to raise a family in this beautiful country, and the soldier who, with flintlock in hand, secured his homestead and his future. At this point, we are, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. She is going to conduct the first part of this programming, focusing mainly on women's attire. Thank you, Joe. I've never heard him call me Kathy before. <laughs> it, weird. It, it sounded weird. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning. What were women pioneers wearing in the early 1800s as they settled this new wild territory. The first garment she would have worn was called the chemise. Joe, you could actually assist me. The chemise is the one with the uh, skirt with the, the fabric. Yes, that one straight ahead. Thank you. A chemise was worn by both men and women. It was a simple garment with either long or short sleeves worn for modesty as well as for warmth. This simple undergarment has survived to the present you would know it today as the common cotton t-shirt. The chemise was also often referred to as a shift. Now I want to let you know about the one that Joe is holding. This was actually an ingenious invention by someone. If you look at Robin, could you stand up for a minute? Robin is also wearing a shift. That is the white garment that she has on. It served as a basically a blouse with her waistcoat she's wearing. And it also served as a nightshirt. Men also wore a shift. Same thing, they wore them as shirts during the day. They evolved many, many, many times, and they also wore them as nightshirts. So, as I said, they basically evolved into the, the common t-shirt. And this one is ingenious because the bottom was actually fabric, so they, the woman wearing that could have actually put a waistcoat like that onto the top of it, and it would look like she's wearing the chemise and the skirt, or the underskirt. Thank you, Joe. So as I mentioned, the chemise is also known as a shift. You may have read in historic accounts of a nefarious character being referred to as shiftless. Well, as you may have guessed, that is exactly what it implies. That a person was of a questionable moral character to the point that they may not be wearing their shift. So literally, shiftless. So, very scandalous. So enough about that. In addition to the chemise, a lady would have worn a pair of split drawers. Up until the age of the rebellious flapper and the demise of the traditional corset, 
split drawers were a necessity that no lady of fine breeding would ever have been without. <laughs> Again, worn for modesty and warmth. You may be wondering, why are they split? Well, given the fact that the drawers were worn beneath the corset, when, you need, when the need arose to visit the privy, a lady was unable to remove her drawers while wearing the corset, which was over the top. So if you stop and think about that, um, during this time in the early 1800s, every pioneer woman wore corsets. So she was wearing this, this, this split drawers, which would come up to her waist. go in that to that right now. So as I said, every pioneer woman wore corsets. They could range anywhere from a small midriff piece reaching just below the bust line to a full length long style. This is actually my Victorian corset. It's reversible. I wear this when I go to events and what it does is it fastens up the fronts with hooks and eye and then the back is the infamous lacing. Now from what many people believe Corsets are not uncomfortable unless you are wearing them too tightly. How many of you have ever worn a pair of shoes that are one size too small? Not comfortable, right? Same thing with the corset. Yes, at one point, corsets did get very tight, but it wasn't the corset's fault. That was the women literally trying to outdo each other, trying to have the smallest waist. And that, again, that's another whole presentation that I do. So, oops, stay tuned for, for that one. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, so next we have hose. Um, our lady would have worn a pair of long cotton, silk, or wool stockings. They would have been held up with two ribbon garters. Are they over there, the brown? Above the knees to hold them in place. They could range in design anywhere from plain white to elaborately embroidered ones with clocks or embroidery at the ankles. So Joe, when you get a chance, hold up the clock, hold up those, you'll see the yellow is actually, these are actually woven in, but ladies spend long, long hours actually embroidering clocks into their hose. And there are some incredible examples in European museums, especially that were some of the aristocracy that are at, those are all embroidered, they're absolutely stunning. And then the garters that Joe is also holding, they're absolutely wonderful, they're actually knit. And like he just said, he put, or did, he put it through the hole and then you can tighten it and then put a little loop and that's how the stockings were, they were held up. Remember, elastic, lycra, none of that exists yet for a very long time. So finally, over these basic underpinnings, our fine lady would have done several petticoats. The first and least decorative petticoat was the modesty petticoat. That Joe is just a plain, it's right over here next to, um, right, where did I see it? It's just a plain old, it looks like a piece of muslin. Over there? Yes. No, those are the drawers. <laughs> okay, it's a plain, I think it's under the fancy petticoat. So the first and least decorative petticoat was for modesty's sake. A modesty petticoat was exactly what it implied. Over the top of what, over the top of which would then be worn a decorative petticoat. Usually, okay, usually more elaborate than the one beneath, often embellished with fine needlework and embroidery again. Depending on the desired fullness, several more petticoats would have been worn, each one more decorative than the previous. It is important to note that at this time, the outermost decorative petticoat would transition into an outer skirt, which was expected to be seen. Yes, that's it. So this, is, so this is the modesty petticoat. It is literally a piece of linen or muslin worn close to the body. During the summer, it would help to absorb perspiration, and in the winter it would, it would provide warmth. And then over the top, you have the satin one with the uh, fuchsia at the bottom. So you can see with this petticoat, this would have been silk, it had ruffles at the bottom, and then that would fill out the, fill out the skirt. And before the crinolines were, or the crinoline that we know of, uh, which would have had boning in it, 
They were actually made of starched um, linen. Remember, we don't, have excuse me, we don't have electricity yet, so if you had a very full skirt that needed to be filled out, you may wear up to 10, 15 petticoats, and you weren't the one pressing them with a good old-fashioned iron that went on the stove and then went on the fire and then went... So imagine, I can't even imagine such a thing. So let's talk briefly about personal hygiene for a moment. Unfortunately, there have been horror stories circulated for years regarding the poor hygiene of generations gone before us. Let me assure you that the vast majority of our ancestors were just as aware of health and hygiene as we are. There were, and still are, always exceptions to the rule. We know those people. But rest assured that the vast majority of stories regarding extremes in lack of personal hygiene or lack thereof are complete fabrications and exaggerations at the tr of the truth. Before the age of mass manufactured health and beauty products, many daily use personal hygiene items, including lye soap being one of them, were made at home from natural ingredients. Perfumes, soaps, toilet water, detergents, washing, detergents for washing clothes, hair tonics were all produced at home with common ingredients, often obtained from nature right outside your backyard. Lye soap is one of those products. It was made from ash, <laughs> made from ash and uh, ash. Ash and tallow, other animal products, oils and fats that would be rendered out. So lye soap is one of those products whose reputation has suffered and has not stood the test of time well. The truth about lye soap is, if not allowed sufficient time to dry out and to cure properly, some of the lye will still be present, resulting in a soap too harsh to wash with. If not cured properly, it was often deemed only safe for cleaning dishes, clothes, and other household items. It is simply a matter of making the soap properly and allowing sufficient time for that lye to cure out. It's basically the idea of, mom, I'm going to make noodles, I'm too hungry, I'm not going to cook them all the way, they're crunchy, they're not right because you just didn't allow the time it needed. So that's all it is with lye soap. It wasn't that it was some horrible caustic, it, people just got impatient apparently and didn't know. So lye soap is, is very, it's not dangerous at all. May I make a point Yes, well? please do. Um, in addition to lye soap, so would, soap would often be made out of tallow, as I said earlier. Tallow is oils and fats that are rendered down from animal products. So when you butcher your cow at the, in the fall, you're going to have a lot of fat oil and marrow that you will actually render out and you can turn it into soap. And it works very well as soap for uh, cleaning dirt and as a degreaser. But another thing I wanted to mention, uh, perfume. Perfume has a very special attachment to the Great Lakes. Uh, very high-end perfume 200 years ago and very high-end perfume today has a very special ingredient in it. It's called castor. It is a compound that enables odors and scents to bind to liquids. That's how you make a very nice perfume. Castor is also the French word for beaver. And castor oil is a special oil that comes from a gland in a part of the beaver that you don't want to know. <laughs> and the, as we will talk more when we discuss the men's go, uh, clothing, fur trade was very important to the Great Lakes region. And the beaver were driving that. And so many of the fine perfumes that the aristocracy in London and Paris were daubing on themselves came from a beaver's behind in the Ohio country. <laughs> Thank you for that colorful commentary, Joe. I did not know that. <laughs> so before we discuss the garments our lovely ladies and gentlemen are wearing this evening, let's explore a little bit about textiles, fibers, and the natural dyes that these garments would have traditionally been made of. Most garments worn around this area on homesteads would have been referred to as homespun. Homespun is a lightweight fabric of linen, cotton, or wool produced by using traditional techniques of hand dyeing, spinning, and weaving. Although it is true that women hand sewed nearly all of the clothing that their families wore, few actually spun the yarn and fewer yet wove their own fabric. Why? Because imported fabric was cheaper and better quality even then than homespun. 
and could be obtained excuse me, that could be obtained locally throughout early America and during the early decades of the 1800s. In fact, Colonial Williamsburg's textile curator, Linda Baumgarten, of whom I was fortunate to meet personally while on a research visit for my master's degree, writes, only in frontier areas was most clothing homespun and homemade, and even then, traders and storekeepers had already quickly penetrated the back country to make imported goods available. Even during the homespun movement, a protest against the taxes and tariffs of the Townsend Act, women learned to spin in order to forego the import tax on fabric. However, in reality, even during the protest, the demand was so great that they could not produce enough fabric at home to truly replace the imports. So for thousands of years, humans have been dyeing textiles with natural dyes. The Ohio country was no exception to the idea of using natural elements which were readily available to dye textiles. Here are a couple of examples that may surprise you, as they did me. So many natural ingredients found literally in our own backyards can very successfully be used to dye. I am certain that our early pioneer ancestors relied on nature to provide rich color and hue to their textiles. Here are a few of the basic colors. Let's start with red. Joe doesn't even know this, so it's going to be like a treasure hunt for him. Um, red could be achieved by boiling the bark of the crab tree. And as we would expect, cabot, red cabbage could create a deep purple hue. Orange could be achieved by boiling yellow onions, as well as eucalyptic leaves. Yellow is achieved by boiling alfalfa, alfalfa seeds and the common dandelion, which I remember fondly as a country-raised kid picking bunches of dandelions and then staining my hands. When I went in, mom said, what have you been doing? I haven't been collecting dandelions. So if artichoke leaves are boiled, they produce a beautiful muted green color. I think my biggest surprise is the color achieved from, a, from boiling the skin and pit of an avocado, which I realized are not native to Ohio. <laughs> That's the first thing Joseph said. He's like, you know, mom, we don't have avocados on it. I said, no, Joe, I know this is for effect. So any guess of the color produced by boiling an avocado skin and pit? Any guesses? Pink. Pink. Can you believe it? Pink. Yes, I know. It's crazy. Um, I'm really tempted to try that myself. That would be very cool to do a whole set of underpinnings dyed pink-ish with avocado. So <clears throat> the color near and dear to anyone that lives near Maumee is familiar, is familiar, excuse me, anyone who lives near Maumee is familiar with is br at brownish tan. Does anyone want to venture a guess what are readily available, lo uh, lo what is the real locally available natural thing that produces a brownish tan that's all over Maumee? No, no, you guys haven't been on the wall cup property recently. <laughs> um, if you have ever, pardon? Someone said it. Oh, good. If you have ever been to the Maumee Valley Historical Society in autumn, you would remember the grounds are totally littered with black walnuts. Um, I am certain that they were a very useful resource available to all of the early pioneers and settlers in the local area. In fact, all of the interior woodwork in the Walcott House is beautiful black walnut. This is actually a beautiful little piece of wood of black walnut. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful. So do yourself a favor one day, come to the Walcott house on a um, Saturday and do a tour and you'll see all the beautiful black walnut. Um, when Joe comes up, he has a little story to tell about black walnut, about dying. Yes. So um, now let us move on to what our lovely models are wearing tonight. As you can see, we have four totally different looks, one, two, three totally different looks including a very elegant gown displayed here by Gloria. She's going to stand up for us. Oop, you dropped your accessories, my dear. This gown represents the beginning of our story of apparel from the early 1800s. Each of these garments would have been familiar to the early settlers of the Ohio country. As we look at the first gown, you will likely associate it with the French Revolution, Marie Antoinette, and the European aristocracy of the late 18th century. This style is often referred to as a pannier gown. The side pillows effect is the pannier. That refers to the unique shape of the petticoat underneath the skirt, which creates a horizontal silhouette at the hips. 
This is, in fact, a very modest pannier gown. Some extant examples in European museums have widths measuring up to seven or eight feet in diameter, in width. You can just look them up online, look up pannier dress, and there's some incredible examples out there. In fact, as a side note, French doors literally were invented as a solution to the real issue of upper class ladies' inability to navigate through standard doorways while wearing pannier gowns. In response, in response, French doors were modified thus, that's why we call them French doors, because it was a French style. Now ladies could gracefully proceed through doorways without obstruction. So looking at the pannier gown, you will see a boned bodice, which would be the top, a split skirt exposing an underskirt, three quarter length sleeves, a plunging neckline, or decollete as it's referred to, and a very unique front panel called the plastron or stomacher. As mentioned earlier, the skirt is split to reveal the underskirt. As elaborate textiles became more readily available for the European aristocracy, this gown, although not, not worn by early pioneer women living in the Ohio country in the early 1800s, would have been very, very familiar with it. So variations of this gown that she's wearing are all present in what Robin's wearing, what Glory's wearing, and what I'm wearing. So this would have been the height of fashion. This would have been a totally bone bodice, and this is what I refer to as the plastic. The garment. Okay, so this is the garment. Of course. And this is the plastern. The plastron could have been changed out and they were put on with straight pins. Remember, safety pins don't exist yet, zippers don't exist yet, any of that stuff. So what a woman would do, she would have different plasterns that she could switch out with her dress and she would pin it, she would pin it, flip this back, pin it down here, and then she would put it over and then she would pin it down there and that's how her plasterns stayed on. And if anyone has ever wondered why a safety pin is called a safety pin, prior to its invention in the 1850s, was it? Baby's diapers were held on with straight pins. Think about that. Think about how much an infant rolls around. So pins, if you know any, any nuns to this day, they still use straight pins to keep their veils on and things. So here's her split, her split skirt. So this is the elaborate petticoat you would have seen underneath of it. Um, this would have been worn over an elaborate petticoat, so it would uh, kind of hard to see. But this is the back of it. It's got a big pleat up the back. One of my favorite things about historic clothing is a lot of times an artist will grab onto a style and love it so much that they just want to just keep reproducing it in their artwork. The story with Watteau is that exact story. If you were to turn around, this one doesn't have it, but a Watteau back, it comes off in pleats and basically creates almost like a train effect. Watteau, the artist, you can turn around. The artist Watteau loved that look so much. Almost every single painting he did has a Watteau gown in it to the point it was named a Watteau gown. It wasn't named a Watteau gown. It was actually called a sack dress at the time. Um, so my dress is a, oh, actually, let me have Robin come up. So Ro this lady would be aristocracy. Um, I'm poor. She, she's actually one of our wonderful pioneer ladies out, on, out in Northwest Ohio working. Uh, so this would be her chemise. You can see that she would draw this up and she could pull in the sleeves. This pulled around there. Um, she's wearing basically a, a modest petticoat and this would be a waistcoat. Men all vests during this period were also called waistcoats. It's laced up. It's got grommets that are hand stitched. There are little holes that are hand stitched with a blanket stitch, which Joe will probably talk about in a minute. What's unusual about this is, again, metal does not exist yet in this form, so they can't have metal grommets the way my Victorian corset, my later Victorian corset has. So that's what enabled tight lacing to go crazy because they could really wrench down on these eyelets and they would never tear. These would tear. So this was utilitarian. Then it, when the Industrial Revolution came along and we had metal grommets that revolutionized fashion in a major way. Then we had steel that we could put into corsets, which really created the hourglass silhouette. Um, she's wearing a cap, because all women would have had a cap during the day of some sort, even if they were in the house. And you'll notice the red work. A lot of times young girls needed to learn, all women at this time, knew some sort of needle craft sewing because that's the way it, she would support her family. So this is called red work. This is actually an embroidered, looks like a maybe a dresser scarf. It was a really nice way for young girls to learn their needle crafts and red dye was very, very prominent during this time because it was a natural dye. So her, pe her 
waistcoat would have been red flannel and you'll see the red work around her bodice and that's just a way of making something very decorative really quickly um, flannel petticoats how many of you have seen gone with the wind okay do you remember when Rhett comes back and gives Mammy a gift and she's just remember what the what the gift is it was a red flannel petticoat because doctors during this time believed that wearing wool against the body helped keep women well, I'll have the quote somewhere but women in Britain apparently were getting sick and, the, and some American doctors decided that it must be because they're not wearing wool flannel against their bodies. <sighs> I can't imagine wearing wool flannel underneath of everything. So you'll see a lot of wool flannel in historic reference. That's because people believed, because the medical, professions t medical profession told them so, it was healthy. <laughs> Don't even get me started on that. So um, my dress then, so you may sit down. Thank you, my dear. So of course you can sit down. Oh, actually, no, you don't sit down yet, Gloria. Yes, honey. Okay. Ah, I gotta hurry up. Um, okay. Um, my dress really quickly is the 1800, 1810, 1812 dress, which was the Ampere version. What was happening? French Revolution didn't go very well. Nobody wanted to be associated with the aristocracy anymore. At the same time, ancient ruins of Greece and um, Rome were discovered with all these women in these beautiful diaphanous gowns so there's that's where fashion went to so that's where this design came from the style came from in about 1810 that's why it's called ampere which is a fancy word for empire like the roman empire simple as that so you can see all three of our gowns are all basically almost the same design just very vari variations one last thing and then i'll let joe come up these are her you'll notice she doesn't have anything on her forearms which would have been very improper she would either be wearing long gloves or she would put her false undersleeves on. Which I end up there. Ta ta da! Look at that. Ta da! It was a really nice way of them extending a garment. They could, they could, these would get dirty, they could just wash them. And she also has, she has slits in here. Where did we put them? Here, there. She has slits in here. The reason the slits are on each side is she would have a pocket underneath, underneath here. It's just a little pouch with a, with a hole in it. So she could reach in, put things in her pocket. Now this is one of my favorite bits of American tour, of fashion trivia. This is called a pocket. If you fold it in half, it kind of looks like a book, right? If she's got her belongings in it and she does this, folds it, and she does this and wraps it around and ties it, it becomes a pocketbook. Ha, ah, bing! Isn't that cool? So those were her pockets. So you may sit down. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's all. There's a million other things I could tell you, but I know Joe is clamoring to get his good stuff. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Okay, Joe, you're up. All right. Now, for men's garments, both civilian and military, it followed very similar the trends that were governing women's clothing. But a thing that we want to make note of is that out here on the frontier, it's very different what people were wearing versus Philadelphia, or Washington City, or London, or Paris. Now, these folks were not ignorant to fashion. And in fact, fashion on the frontier would actually be adopted very quickly not long after it would be adopted in civilization. However, fashion has a tendency to be adopted faster than it fades away. Now, how many in here, specifically men, own a pair of khakis with pleats in the front? Okay, <laughs> quite a few. It's okay, they're good pants. <laughs> now, how many people in here own a pair of skinny jeans? Okay, see? Now you have two different items, very different, very different eras of fashion, but they're still existing in the same time. And that's what you would have gotten, even back then. Now, by the time Ohio started being settled, we're well, in, we're well into the end of the colonial period. We're emerging into the umpire or regency period, as it would be called in England. Um, so the buckle shoes and knee breeches of the Founding Fathers was done. It had been done in the frontier, 
for a very long time because you know what? Knee breeches and buckle shoes are not very good with slogging through a swamp. So the folks on the front here were actually one of the first ones to actually start wearing pants. An amazing invention. Things on your legs that go all the way down to your ankles. Pants had been worn out here in the Ohio country since the 1600s. And before we dive into some more of the actual men's clothing, I do want to make a note, and I just want to take a minute to talk about what were the natives wearing here at this time period. Well, what's important to note is that this period that we're talking about, the early 1800s, this was European expansion into the New World was not new by this period. For instance, the Wyandotte tribe that lived here in northern Ohio. They had been living, trading, and inter intermarrying with the French for 200 years already. So the indigenous people that you would have seen in the old northwest at this time were not running around wearing breechcloths and buckskins. They were wearing an amazing blend of traded items, European-made goods, and beautifully embroidered hand-built, handmade um, native clothing. And here in the Old Northwest was a really beautiful melting pot. You had the Americans coming in to settle. You had the French that had been there for two centuries. You have English travelers. You have Russian fur traders. You have Scotch-Irish to Spanish. All are coming here primarily to work the fur trade because they want the beaver. And so that's why here today, this is why my outfit looks very unique. It's colorful. I have a nose ring on. This is all things that you could have expected an American settler to be wearing in the Ohio country in, say, 1803, 1805. Now, to break down what I'm wearing specifically, the coat that I have on, this is one of the most American garments in history. This is what we call the hunting shirt or the rifle frock. This is a purely American garment. It was developed here on the frontier in the 1700s. It is usually made out of a very coarse, very strong material. This right here is what we know as jean cloth. It's half wool and half cotton. It's very cheap to make, but it's very strong. It's essentially the equivalent of car car. <coughs> and the fringe. This is very unique. Now, originally when these garments would be made, it was something that was quickly made to keep your good clothes protected. Bugs, thorns, and so you would often just leave the edges raw, and they would fray. Well, that became a style. And so by the time you get to the early 1800s, the fringe would often be a different color, it would be very long, and everybody's hunting frock or hunting shirt was specifically tailored to them. And they would put their own embellishments. They might do beautiful beadwork. They might uh, stencil words onto the cape, such as liberty. And I have my waistcoat on, my vest. Again, they got a bead cloth, a very inexpensive yet durable material. And my trousers died out of all that. So again, this is another <laughs> natural dyed material. I have my leggings or my garters on. Those are going to protect the bottoms of my pants and the top of my shoes from rocks falling in, keep the, the ticks and chiggers at bay. And finally, I have the one thing that almost every man out in the Ohio country would have had. This is his possible bag. It is a do-all, hold-all bag. It's your shooting bag, hold your ammo, hold bandages, hold food, pretty much anything you might need, this man purse <laughs> is going to carry it for you. And again, this company with the powder horn would always be very unique to the individual. It would have special religious symbols carved onto it, or patriotic symbols, and the horns would almost always have the owner's name engraved on it. Now, this is what the frontiersman was wearing. But the frontiersmen living in the Ohio country, settling the Ohio country, 
is not the frontiersman of the age of Daniel Moon crossing the gap, okay? The age of the long hunter is over by this point. The age of the fur trapper is over at this point in Ohio. These were people that were coming out to be farmers, to be storekeepers, to be clerks. They were not wild men, but they had to know how to live in a low contact area. Now, this is what you might wear when you're going to work or you're going hunting. But if you're going into town, you're going to wear something a little nicer, like the tailcoat. Almost every individual probably owned at least one good wool tailcoat. Made out of a heavy, kersey woven broadcloth. It's going to keep the wind out, but it's also going to be very elegant. It's going to have the large lapels and collar that is signature of the early Regency or Empire era. Now, in the winter time, there was a almost sort of uniform that men would wear out on the frontier. And that uniform was this. This is what we call a capote. It's a French word, which means coat, made out of wood. And that's exactly what it is. This is what we call a blanket coat. This is actually cut and sewn out of a tray blanket. Now, for those who don't know, tray blankets were big, heavy wool blankets. We have one out here on the, on the steps right now. They were big, heavy wool blankets, and they were the most common thing traded in the frontier in North America for almost 300 years. And they were big enough that you could often make a nice coat for you. And these were great because instead of having to pay a tailor or have your significant other sew you a nice coat, you can buy a blanket and do some crude sewing and have your capote. So these were very, very common, almost like a uniform. And speaking of uniforms, let's talk a little bit about soldiers in the Old Northwest. Now, there were two types of soldiers that would see action in these early days of Ohio. Regulars and militia. Regulars. These were the soldiers that were working for Uncle Sam. They were in the Army for three to five years. They were professional. They knew their drill. They knew how to fight. And then you had the militia, which was none of those things. <laughs> the militia was, we're a bunch of farmers, and we have our militia drill once a year, which is we all get together at the town square, we march around for about 15 minutes, and then we head to the tavern. But militia duty was required for every able-bodied man living in Ohio territory. And even once it became a state, it was required. And so every man needed to own at least one good flintlock. And when you came to militia muster, you would pretty much wear this. You'd have your hunting frock, probably have your fossils bag. You bring your old flintlock shotgun that you had hanging above the wall, but you needed something to make you look a little more military. And in this time period, it became hats. Men of this time period loved to try to out-hat each other. In Ohio, the Ohio militia was particularly good at that. Now this hat, is very distinctive of a frontier soldier. The crest is made out of black there, and the tail is a bucktail. Now the tail itself signifies that if I was wearing this, I belong to a rifle regiment. So I'm not carrying a regular musket, I'm carrying a rifle. Because in order to get into a lot of militia rifle companies, you had to prove that you were accurate enough and shoot a buck at 200 yards. And then you get your bucktail. Now, for the regulars, the soldiers that actually knew how to do their job, again, they had to try to out-hat each other. You would have something like this, what we now call the shako. Looks very similar to what a lot of high school bands still wear today. Well, this was copied uh, off of the British, who were copying it off of the French, because remember, this is the early 1800s, Napoleon. The entire world wants to be like Napoleon's army. Now, is this a practical piece of head, headgear to be wearing out in the frontier? Absolutely not. <laughs> I have worn these out in the summer, and I can tell you that wearing a big leather pot on your head is not very comfortable. But, 
When you have 500 guys standing in an open field, all wearing these shoulder to shoulder, it makes your line look just a little bit taller and just a little bit more intimidating. And similarly, the uniform coats of this era were very similar to that tailcoat I showed you. This is the pattern 1813 U.S. Army infantry coat. So it is tail, just like the tailcoat, but it's a little shorter, so it's what they call a coatee. It's blue. Federal blue, that has been the color of the United States Army since its inception, even though during, say, the War of 1812, this era, Blue wool is really expensive, and unfortunately, a lot of the boys that were heading out to the Ohio country to help defend Fort Peg to try to retake the River Raisin, well, they were being issued uh, coats that were brown, green, purple, orange, any wool that was be able to head out east in enough quantity to make thousands of uniforms getting made and was getting sent out here. But this is what your average soldier in the early 1800s stationed at Fort Meg or Fort Stevens would have been wearing, some, or something very similar. I have to check my wireless telegraph here real fast to see how we are doing on time. <laughs> All right, now one last thing I want to uh, talk about is footwear. This is the, uh, for some reason, in our research that we do, shoes one of the things that is always ignored by historians of material culture. And it really drives you nuts when you're a living historian or a reenactor like myself and you're trying to find what the shoes are. But through a lot of research we've been able to learn. Now, your average shoe really has not changed in about 500 years. Pretty much everybody can look at this today and tell you that it's a shoe. Now, construction, material, obviously that has changed. And the era of the early 1800s is actually where we start to see a modern shoe emerge. And what do I mean by a modern shoe? In the early 1800s, they started producing what they called crooked shoes. What are crooked shoes? They're right and left. Before that, it was straight lasted shoes. So a right and a left shoe, they looked identical. You would have to break them in and wear them and hope that they can actually mold to your feet. But they actually started birthing right and left. This is right on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution. Joe, can I add real quick? Something like our lovely Lady Gloria, if she had a size seven shoe and she got new shoes that were straight shoes, she just happened to have a lady that worked with her for her that also had a size seven foot. So she would let her lady that worked with her for her wear the shoes in, and then when they were nice and soft and in, they would give, she would give them to her lady, and now they were beautifully comfortable shoes. <laughs> so That's her right. servant had all the blisters. And actually what we have here today, and also all of this, feel free when we're done with the program to come up, check it out, pick it up, ask questions. Um, Almost everything that we have here are reproductions, so they can stand the test if you want to pick them up and check them out. But what we have right here is this is actually an original colonial shoe lattice. So this is what a shoe was built out of. It's straight. It's also incredibly narrow. Does this look like it's going to make a comfortable shoe? No. But shoes were very important. <clears throat> you can talk about mine. Okay. And women's shoes constructed very similarly as the men's which actually let me talk about that for a second almost always made out of leather leather sole leather heel and does that look like you have a lot of traction no and also if you've ever owned a very nice pair of dress shoes that has a leather sole you'll probably notice that they tend to wear out pretty fast don't they well, that is why many people would actually put <laughs> cleats. I don't follow them. Put cleats on the bottom of their shoes. It's what we call hobnails. Hobnails and heel plates. It looks, it makes them look like athletic cleats and for grip. It's not really for grip, because I can tell you, <laughs> walking across the linoleum to get here tonight is very, very difficult. 
It actually, what it does is it preserves the shoes because you're, it's going to take a lot longer to wear through those iron studs than it would just wear through the regular leather. Joe, pick up the bonnets and then give me the flat bonnet, and then I'll demonstrate that real quick. I'll just let you do okay. it. <laughs> Cover, now that Joe's covered headwear were bonnets. As I said, a lady would have a lady would have always had something on her head, but what these ladies are both wearing are just indoor caps. So this would be the basic cap that you would put once you come over here, Gloria. So this is just the frame. It doesn't have any embellishment on it, but if she's going outside. She puts that over the top, and I'm sure you've seen images of ladies, and you see their bonnet, and then you see all this lace. That's what it is. It's not lace that's attached to the bonnet. It's actually her bonnet or her cap underneath of it. So now she would have ribbons on it. She would embellish it. So that's the basic. I'm just going to take that right off for you. So that would be the basic one. And then the second one would be more for church. What happened to the brown one? I just had it. Is it under? It's just, oh, it's disappeared. This is a more modest. This is called a stovepipe bonnet. It's a little bizarre, to be, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I'm going to put it on. It looks pretty average from the front, but turn sideways for me. And it's literally like a stovepipe. And it was a style that was in style for, how long was the stovepipes in style for, Joe? Not oh, very long. Not for, because they were a little, and then this is the fancy version, where she would embellish it with ribbons and feathers, etc but it still has that very unique style to it. Thank you, my dear, you may sit down. And then quickly, I would like to show, I'm sure you've all seen Gone with the Wind, which was a, a little slightly later, but I'm sure you've seen these flat, a flat uh, straw hat, something like this. They were very utilitarian, of course, to keep the sun off of you, but if she had a beautiful piece of ribbon that would, might happen to match her dress, she would take a pin, pin it to the top of it and she would put it on her head put that in the back and then she would take the ribbon it would come down and it would create a whole new style just from using actually a flat hat so women and men during this time were very resourceful i always say the victorians especially were incredibly resourceful and they never wasted anything everything that they did always had a purpose so thank you very much for let me show the bonnets. No, that's right. I would say um, at this point, because we only have a few minutes left. Um, oh. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> so excited, I know. Um, before before my, my mother wants to show one more thing, um, after that, we do want to open up for questions. I'm sure some of you might have some questions. And also, again, uh, after that, Please feel free to come up and ask any more questions you might have. Take a look at some of the clothing. Um, we love talking about this, and thank you for having us tonight. So, all right, how are these here? You can hold the box. Okay. I brought this. This is a jewel in the crown of the Maumee Valley Historical Society. Oh, we never didn't even mention that. I'm actually the curator over at the Walcott House. Um, have been for six years. This looks very nondescript, very boring, nothing special. This is a genuine 1795 woman's bodice. Um, it was one time, it's hard to tell, but you can actually see it's wool, I'm wool, wool. It's silk, but it's a plaid. If you look very carefully, you can come up and look at it, but you can actually see a plaid pattern. This is very exciting because what do you see in the front? There's a big gap in it, correct? Now, who's been paying attention? What goes in the center? A plaster, yay, good girl. Yes, a plaster would go in the, in the center. There would be a, a complete skirt that would match it, which would end up, when this was on a lady, it would actually look like what Gloria's wearing. And I love my favorite part of this is this incredible teeny little swallowtail. It's, it's, it's absolutely minuscule. So anyway, this is exciting for me because not only is it an original piece, 1795, if you stop and think about it, who was alive in 1795 when this was being worn by a woman? Oh! But this is very special because I am actually, Joe and I have been commissioned by the Fallen Timbers Commission to build two period correct men's and women's garments for the visitor center. And this is going to be the model for the ladies garment because I can look at it and know exactly how it was constructed. So stay tuned, it's supposed to open in the spring. So I will leave this up here. 
I will put the glo leave the gloves with it so you can actually put the gloves on and feel free to look at it. It's a teaching piece, so don't feel like you're going to hurt it. But we just ask that you wear the cotton gloves. And be very delicate. And be very delicate, yes. So questions, please. Yes. The top hat there, is that a military hat? <clears throat> yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. We got a little step for time. Uh, no, so kind of. Top hats uh, became, came into fashion in the 1790s. And interestingly enough, this is actually one of the most uh, resilient pieces of fashion. I mean, top hats were worn all the way into the 1920s. They didn't change a whole lot. Um, now, that being said, top hats would often be adopted for military use, especially by the militia, but also um, generals and other officers during the War of 1812 especially would often wear top hats out in the field, as opposed to their large bicorn hats, which we've all seen as the big Captain Crunch hat. Um, so both civilian and military, a very common hat worn. Yes. I, I just wonder how you guys keep, like in that whole time or whatever, how your garments are so beautiful looking. I'm sure you don't put them in washing machines like that. How do you keep them so clean and how do they wash them in those days? Uh, hand washing. I mean, Pardon? hand washing. Um, now, most garments that we wear are either cotton or linen based, and so it can be easily washed with warm water and some soap. Um, and they hang them on the line? Mm -hmm. They hang them on the line. Now, other, other uh, items, particularly woolen items, you can't exactly wash because they'll shrink. So, what do you do? Well, what you actually do is you use a alcohol, a clear alcohol, usually corn liquor, mixed with water, and you're actually going to spray it or drizzle it onto the coat, and you're going to hang it up and let it dry. When it dries, the alcohol dries odorless and will kill any bacteria, neutralize any odors, and can actually even help with stains. When I uh, was dresser over, or when I was costume designer over at the uh, opera, we would have European dancers come in, and they have in their contract that their garments are not to be washed, only to be sprayed each night in the underarms, put inside, turned inside out, so they can air out, but only use vodka. And it was, I have a very funny story. When Joe was about 16, we were over at the Walcott, we were at the Walcott house, and Joe walked in. I was in the office with Tanya, and Joe said, Hey, Mom, where's the vodka? <laughs> I knew exactly what I, I, exactly what I the look on well, her face, like, what are you, why are you? So, yes. Clean uniforms. Yes, clean uniforms. Thank you. Great question. Any others? Yes. yes. Where was the, the, um, the, I can't remember the name of the uh, garment that you found from 1795. Where was it found? I don't know. It's, uh, it's been in the Historic Society's collection. Um, I've, one of the things I do over there is organizing the historic clothing collection, and we it was it needed a lot of organizing. And I opened this, I saw this box one day, which was an archival box that the box that's in the special, there's no acid in it, et cetera. That's what archival, that's what historic armor should be stored in. And I looked at it, and I looked, turned it around, and there was I opened it up, there was tissue in, it, and there's a little card on top that said 1795 bodice, and I went, <gasps> so it's just very exciting. For us in, in America, it's hard to, it's, we have things from the 1800s, but something that pushes the envelope there, we have no idea. There was nothing with it. It's, fortunately, it's been saved because somebody might see that in a garage sale. If you saw that in a garage sale, you would just pass it over like, oh, some sort of a cheap old, ah. But as soon as I looked at it carefully, I knew exactly what it was, and it was very exciting to find it. Most garments from this era have not survived. Right. Right. Yes. They say that Wake High School was built on the site of an Indian village. And uh, I was wondering if that village was gone by the time the War of 1812 took place. That is a very difficult question to answer. Um, uh, that is accurate. It was built on the Indian village, and that's where we have the swale and stuff like that. But it was gone by the time of the War of 1812. This is Indian land that was purchased by the Platt family that lived in East Toledo, and then they sold it to the Board of Education. I heard once where they had found artifacts when they were building the school. Um, I do believe that is true. I don't know what happened to those artifacts, but yeah. They so were very carefully.
especially in Northwest Ohio, tribes moved in and out so much between about 1600 and 1830, because you had tribes that had lived in Ohio for generations, such as the Shawnee, but then you also had tribes like the Seneca and the Wyandotte, who didn't even arrive here until the 1750s because they were being pushed out by the Iroquois. Um, so, in this case, she was able to provide you with an answer, but a lot of times it's, it's kind of difficult. A very good question. Anyone else? Yes. Well, this is a little bit off topic, but... We love uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a fan of Artemisia Gentileske? Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Well, she was an artist, her father was an artist, and she was an artist, and she did a really good job of painting robes. Oh. And one of her paintings is in the Great Gallery at the Art Museum. Oh, really? And there's a whole picture of it. Unfortunately, something happened in her life, I won't go into it, but something happened in her life that made her feet men. Hmm. But she just has a real long history. But my sister, when she went to the museum, and there was one of her paintings. Oh, wow. Paintings. Wow. And it's just, just so beautiful how she could paint robes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will, absolutely. We are, okay, we are so fortunate with our art gallery. It's just amazing what we have here in Toledo. You can find it here in Toledo. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions right now, thank you for all coming yeah, out thank today. You. Thank and you, thank we you. encourage you to come up and ask more questions. And ask more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, there are some free yearbooks here. If you would like to take one, you're more than welcome. And some other the Toledo history items that we get donated to our archives that we're flowing with, so feel free to take that. If you can't tell, Kathy and Joe are very passionate about the particular topic. Our kitchen window looks at their house, and any day Kathy comes out of these weird new outfits, and it could be any. She century. texted me one day and said, I saw you in 1820 garb. What are you doing? Joe does World War II. <laughs> Tonight is our student to come here, though. She came out of this and met the Amazon delivery. <laughs> and I have no idea what you said. <laughs> He's like, I have no idea. I have time warp. Uh, thank you again for coming. Please take a postcard. The next uh, lecture is at Bowser High School, and that's the one you don't want to miss. There are 10 major Toledo item collectors, and it's going to be like Ooh. an antiques roadshow. The items will not be appraised, but they're going to be there on display. Tiffany's Coffee will have a display and coffee for sale, so you want to come out and see some of these items that people have collected over the years. Really, really some rare items in Toledo history. Did you have a question? Did you have a no. question? Okay. Well, I was just going to say something. My girlfriend looks out the other window in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. When am I going to be invited for dinner? <laughs> 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 uh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, please feel free to come up and look at anything and, and enjoy. Thank you. Okay, Joe.